Hello and welcome to Baiju's exam prep IAS. A very, very warm good morning to everyone. I hope all of you are doing good. We are back once again to analyze the day's Hindu newspaper. I welcome you all to this session. I hope all of you are doing good. I hope your preparation in the last few days before the prelims examination is going right on track. As always, we'll be discussing some of the most important news stories covered in today's Hindu newspaper, both from the mains as well as from the prelims examination point of view. Good morning, those who have joined in right on time at 10 a.m. Thank you so much for being very, very punctual. Let's see what are the important topics that we'll be discussing from today's Hindu newspaper. These are the topics that we have taken up. From the mains examination point of view, we have three editorial articles. First one on the concept of carbon emission. In fact, we have four articles and not three. The second one is on a very interesting topic that is about salt intake. Salt, as you know, NaCl has sodium. And as per various reports, it has been found out that sodium intake where it goes beyond a certain level can be very, very harmful to the human body. There in fact has been a recent WHO report that talks about the fact that salt intake in larger quantities can be detrimental to our health. So there's an article written on that. Then we'll be discussing about the demand for independence once again from Scotland. So Scotland has been demanding they want to be independent from Great Britain. So they want to be a separate independent country and have all the powers with themselves. Right now, most of the powers about lawmaking, most of the powers about the country's revenue, etc. is with the joint parliament, that is the UK parliament. Then we have the defamation law. Again, this is in the news because of the episode regarding Mr. Rahul Gandhi. These are the four editorial articles. Then we will be discussing about some topics from prelims point of view. First, about PM Swanidhi scheme under which the government has said in the parliament that only 9.3% of the loans are going to vendors or minority community. Then we will be discussing about Philippines decision to give four more military bases to the US. And in the end, we will be discussing about OPEC plus decision to cut down on the oil supply and the impact it would have on the global oil prices. So let's see from the very beginning details of the first article. Now the first article is based on a very interesting idea. The idea is in very simple terms carbon tax. Now I'm sure all of you would have read something about carbon tax, putting a cost on carbon. Now what exactly is this? Let's try and understand. The idea floating around the world is if we have to fight against climate change, then we have to put the responsibility on those industries and those individuals who are responsible for pollution. Let's try take a very simple example. Let's assume that you have an industry. Let's say you have a manufacturing plant. Okay. And uh, let's say you make clothes or you make plastic bottles, anything. Depending upon how much carbon emission is your factory making, you have to pay a cost for that. For example, the government decided that per ton you have to pay 100 rupees. So if your factory emits, let's say 100 tons of carbon, then 100 into 100, 10,000 rupees will be your fine. In simple terms, this is called carbon tax. You have to put taxes on those people, additional tax, additional penalty on those people who are emitting carbon. This is a simple idea. Now, the problem here is how actually will you ensure that this tax is put? And when you are putting such kind of taxes on the companies, you are increasing the cost of the company, right? Just imagine if I'm running a company right now to make t-shirts or to make jeans and my company is emitting a lot of carbon into the atmosphere. Then the government tomorrow says you have to pay an extra tax because your factory is emitting so much carbon. So obviously my cost of making those t-shirts and jeans will increase. So at the end of the day, who will have to pay the burden? It will be the end consumer you will have to pay the burden who is buying the product of that particular factory. So it's not as easy as it sounds that just put carbon tax on the industry because industry will always pass this carbon tax on to the end consumer. So it is the end consumer at the end of the day that will have to suffer. Now, however, there are many countries that have found out very interesting ways of imposing carbon tax. The author says there are three ways seen around the world in which how countries are putting a tax on carbon emission. First, for example, 
in Korea and Singapore, establishment of carbon tax domestically. As I said, carbon tax in simple terms in Singapore and Korea, South Korea is the same that I just explained to you. Depending upon the emission of a certain factory, emission of a certain industry, they will have to pay the tax, number one. Second way to do that is what is happening in European Union and China. This is called emission trading system. Now, what is emissions trading system? Let's try and understand this. So basically what will happen, let's say the government of India gives a kind of emission budget to every factory. Let's try and understand this. Let's say government of India tells Tata that you can emit 400 tons of carbon in one year. To Reliance, the government will say, <clears throat> based on your track record, we will give you quota of 500 tons. To Adani, they will say, okay, depending upon what your production levels are, we will give you a quota of 500 tons. This is what you can do. Okay. Now what happens is, let's assume that Reliance in this case only emitted 300 tons. They only emitted 300. They saved 200 from their quota. So when they save 200 from their quota, they will actually transfer it to some other company in return for money. So they can call Adani that, bro, do you need these emissions? We will transfer 200 to you. You give us money in return. Or they will ask Tata, do you need these emissions? We will transfer this quota to you. So this is again a trading system that they trade their emission quota. So that the government is ensured that the emission will remain within a certain limit. The companies also are incentivized to not have any pollution coming out because if a company saves on their carbon emission, they can earn money from other companies. That is a trading system. So that's the second thing. Then the third part or the third way is how EU is importing tariff on carbon content. Now, please understand what EU is doing. EU has said that let's assume they are importing something from China. Listen to this very carefully. This is important. EU says, let's say we are importing something from China. Okay. Now, if they import, let's assume a mobile phone from China. They will study how much carbon emission did it take to actually make that mobile phone in China. And they will compare it with the mobile phone that can be made in Europe. If EU thinks that some other country is sending mobile phones to EU or importing anything to EU by harming the environment, by having a lot more carbon emission, then again EU will put taxes on them. So EU is saying even if you are selling stuff in Europe, which you produce in your own country, which you produce emitting a lot of carbon, you already have hurt the environment and we will take taxes from you. This is import tariff. These are the three ways in which usually nations have imposed carbon tariff. I'll repeat that once again. First way, that is the one seen in Singapore and South Korea. The governments will take money from the factories in return for whatever emission that they do. Second one, as we discussed, EU China, where the governments will give a quota to their companies, to their factories, that this is the amount of carbon that you can emit. If they don't use the entire quota, they can sell that, trade that to any other company. And the third one is in EU. What EU is saying is, if you import something to European Union and for manufacturing that stuff in your own country, you polluted the environment, even then we will take taxes from you. So these are the three ways in which usually countries have this tax. Now in India, do we have this kind of a tax? Not so far. In India, we do not have this kind of a tax. The companies are not forced to pay a tax depending upon their emissions in India. This is the problem. The article says that unless big emission countries such as China, India, US, unless these countries come together and make this kind of a law that is putting taxes, that is carbon tax, the world will not change. So the onus has been put on India. The IMF in fact has proposed what should be the level of this carbon tax? IMF has said that US should have a $75 per ton carbon tax. 
China should have a $50 per ton carbon tax. India should also have a $25 per ton of carbon tax. This is the idea suggested by the IMF. Now, India has not implemented that. Now, why have we not implemented this? The idea is very simple, as I discussed. If a government says to the company that you have to pay extra tax to us for emissions, then the company will pass on that tax to the end consumer. Everything will become more expensive. Common people in India, middle class, lower middle class will not be able to afford that. As simple as that. So that is why number one, governments in India or in developing nations are not really in favor of this. Second problem, if the government of India imposes such tax on Indian companies, then the stuff that is imported from outside India, that will be considered as cheaper. So people of India, consumers of India will start buying cheaper products from China rather than buying Indian products. That is why the government of India does not really believe that we should actually go ahead with this kind of a decision. Now, the author says that India has to find a way, any of these three or any other way that India wants, but we have to start a carbon tax. Now, Imposing a carbon tax, for example, will have two important consequences. First, it will force the companies to reduce their emission, right? For any company, at the end of the day, they all want to earn profit. The more money they spend on carbon tax, lesser profit they will be. So if they have to earn profit, they have to reduce the emission. So this is number one. Secondly, it will give the government money that can be spent on renewable energy projects. That is the entire idea. So whatever tax that the government collects, that tax now can be used in research for green energy, research for, let's say, better solar panels, wind energy. So the money that the government collects can be used for that as well. Now, policymakers in India have to choose the tax rate. The tax rate can be depending on different countries. For example, Japan right now has a tax rate on carbon emissions of about $2.65 per ton. Whereas Denmark has a very high tax rate. Denmark actually puts $165 per ton as the tax rate. The problem, however, in India is the same. If we put all these taxes on our companies, number one, they will pass on these taxes to the end consumer. Everything will become costlier. And secondly, it will mean that Indian consumers will buy products made outside India because they will be cheaper as compared to made in India. That is why we are not really in favor of doing this. Now, other countries also have this problem because see, any government that goes ahead and increases the cost of living for people, that government will always have a hard time winning the election. That is why every political party you will see, not just in India, around the world, they keep on announcing freebies. The reason why freebies are announced in democratic countries around the world is no government wants to increase the cost of living for their citizens because then they will not get the votes. In Australia, for example, they introduced carbon tax in 2012. Then they saw all the protests within two days. They said, okay, we are taking it back. Similarly, we have seen EU as well. Although EU increase or put these kind of taxes, all of a sudden they saw the cost of living increasing. With Ukraine, Russia war, they again have an issue of the oil prices increasing. So in a lot of European countries also, there are talks against this kind of a carbon tax. So it's not just India. Many countries around the world are having this issue. What to do with this? Do we have to put this burden on our citizens or not? Or do we just let the environment be? Now, the idea of carbon tax, as I told you, it's a very old idea. It's not a new idea. It has been debated multiple times at the UNFCCC also. The developing countries want the developed nations to take the responsibility. The developed nations say that past is past. Now talk about the present. The developed nations say whatever has happened 200 years ago, 100 years ago, let's not talk about that. Let's talk about what is happening right now. Right now, if China, India, they are polluting a lot, then they should stop polluting. India, China, we say that first of all, look at the per capita emission and also look at the past. Developed nations are the ones who are mainly responsible. So this idea has still not really found a solution. But yes, carbon tax is something that is a reality and is a part of discussions usually in all the climate change talks.
the simple idea of carbon taxes to ensure that the burden of the damage of the environment should be put on those who are emitting the pollution and that money that is collected from this should be used later on on renewable energy projects. This is an infographic just to show you what are the impacts of all these carbon emissions. For example, out of all the carbon emission that we have in the world, about 87% is man-made and 13% only is from natural resources. Thus, it is in our own hands to decide how much carbon emission do we actually want to have in our environment. We can't blame the nature, we can't blame anyone else. It is on us because 87% of it is human made. Since 1751, that is considered as the benchmark because after that industrial evolution started taking off. Since 1751, carbon dioxide has actually increased by over 3 lakh percentage. That's not even a number that you can actually try and understand. But this is why all these problems related to carbon tax, they have to be resolved as soon as possible. As I told you, carbon tax is a noble idea, but it has its own set of problems, especially for the developing countries. It will increase the production cost of everything. It will impact the poor more. It's a regressive tax. Impact the poor more means when at the end of the day, the companies pass on these taxes, these increased costs to the end consumer, the end consumer will have to pay more. It also would be a problem because there is no specific method of calculating what should be the carbon tax. It's a very random. As we discussed, Tokyo on one hand or Japan on one hand, Denmark, Sweden, these countries on the other hand, there is a wide gap about how much should be the exact carbon tax. And India believes that we should not be imp imposing carbon tax because per capita emission of India is still very, very low. Overall emission of India may be very high now, but if you divide that by population, India's per capita emission is extremely low as compared to most other nations around the world. So this is the idea behind the carbon tax. Just to underline India does not have a carbon tax right now. Indian government does not like this idea because we don't want our people's cost of living to increase. On the other hand, the developed countries want India, China, all these countries to start imposing carbon tax. This was the first topic. Let me quickly take up some of your comments before we go ahead. Kishan, we don't have carbon tax. So binding or voluntary, there is no question of that. We do not have carbon tax right now in India. When we have it, then we'll talk about is it binding, voluntary or whatever. For no country, is it binding? Then I have a question from Peter Parker. At one side, Western countries beside themselves from the CBDT. Where has CBDT come in from? Central Board of Direct Taxes? I'm not sure if your question is making sense. Okay, I'll take some other question. Um, then I have a question from Godzilla. Per capita emission means, means total emission, total carbon emission of India divided by India's population. Shivankar is saying, please explain the impact on India. As we discussed, the impact on India will be simple. If we do impose carbon taxes, inflation, cost of living will increase because the end consumer will have to pay more for products. Also, maybe foreign made products will be sold more in India. They will be preferred. That is the entire system. Uh, Manish, there are multiple machines now that can measure carbon emissions. You just have to measure whatever uh, out, whatever smoke, etc. that you are being, that any factory is emitting. It can be very easily measured. Uh, those who are asking for the PDF, you can download all the PDF of every CNA from the description of the video. Once the video ends, there is a description below the video. Click on that description. You will see a link to download the PDF and you can do that. That is why you do not make, need to make your own notes in my opinion. But if you want to make notes, who can stop you? That is your decision. Perfect. Let's move ahead then. The next important article, the next interesting article, in fact, is on a day-to-day -day topic that is salt intake. I'll tell you one thing. 
this habit of reading the newspaper every day, especially the Hindu newspaper every day, it's also a bit dangerous because you get to know about so many different diseases and you keep on thinking, I am I also suffering from these kind of diseases? Because the diseases that they talk about, the symptoms that they talk about, all these problems, you can relate to most of these. So for example, I do take more than average salt. So when we read these kind of articles, how salt intake that is higher than usual can cause a lot of problems. This is not really a very happy article to read. But yes, it is an important article. So basically the simple idea is WHO has released a report under which WHO says that a lot of nations, especially India, they have much more salt in their meal than what is required. WHO suggests that the salt intake per day should be less than 5 grams. That is the ideal number. Less than 5 grams should be the salt intake daily. That is what WHO suggests. India's level usually is 11 grams. I'm sure mine would be close to 15, 16, but India's level is about close to 11 grams. So we are almost double, in fact, more than double of what the WHO recommended level is. Now, the problem here is that NaCl, Na, that is sodium, that is not very good for our body when it is taken beyond a certain limit. And that is where the problem starts. So what is it that the government can do? What is it that the government is supposed to do after this kind of report? This is what the article is based on. So what does excess or excessive sodium do in our body? It leads to hypertension, heart diseases and stroke. So an average Indian, as I said, consumes much more than 5 grams. An average Indian is usually consuming close to 11 grams when the limit prescribed by the WHO is less than 5 grams. The latest report that came in from the WHO that is titled Global Report on Sodium Intake Reduction. The report says that the world should now try to reduce their sodium intake by 30% by 2025. This report marked or gave ranking to different countries. Basically, they gave them scores. There were scores from 1 to 4. One was the least score that the country is not even bothered about reducing sodium intake of their people. And four is that the country is really looking forward or trying very hard to reduce sodium intake of their citizens. What did India get? India got number two. So India basically is towards that side of the table where we are not really doing enough. We are not ensuring that the people in India do not intake salt. See, I'll tell you the problem here. When you read these kind of issues, the problem here is, if I tell you, and if I tell you or if I, you ask anyone across the entire country, you ask in your family, what are the 10 biggest problems that you are facing? Forget 10. Ask anyone what are the 50 biggest problems you are facing. And I can bet on this, even in the top 50, they will not say too much sodium is my problem. So when you are living in a country, when you are living in a society where you have so many problems to tackle, having more sodium than what your body requires, it is at a very, very low level actually. So this is not really something that we are accustomed to. If you ask people's problem, they will say, they will say no electricity, no water, environment, and then poverty, and then education, literacy, corruption, I do not get water on time, all these kind of things. In the top 50 problem, no one will say, oh, sodium intake is also a big problem. I have to tackle that. So when it is not a priority for the people, similarly for the government also, it's not really a priority because for the government, the priority is to run a lot of other programs to take care of the people. Not saying that the government is ignoring that. But at the end of the day, you have to see what should be the priority. In a country such as India, developing country where there are a lot of other issues that still remain unresolved, you can't expect the government and the common people now to focus on Nothing else but intake of sodium. Having said that, since the article has been written, let's go through that. So basically, there are studies that suggest even if we reduce sodium intake by 1 gram per day, even if we in reduce our sodium intake by 1 gram per day, it can reduce your blood sugar level by 5 at least, if you are above 55. So again, those who have a high blood sugar level, somewhere down the line, Sodium can be a very, very important reason for that. High blood pressure anyways, 
has been a cause of a lot of problems in our society that are also directly linked with sodium. There are a lot of heart related diseases that can be linked to sodium and that is why having too much salt becomes a problem because salt is the major reason or the major compound or the major way how we actually intake sodium. Most of the other food that we take does not really have sodium. It may have sodium in very small quantities but usually the most intake of sodium that we have in our body is through salt only. The problem is when this becomes so big it also becomes a burden on the government exchequer. The more that the people fall sick, the more that the people are not able to work, the more is a pressure on the government only. So what exactly can we change as per the author? First, we have to ensure that the cardiovascular diseases that we have are reduced and cardiovascular diseases can be reduced only with lesser intake of sodium in our body. It will reduce our mortality rate as well. Data from the National Family Health Survey also suggests that men above 15 or above have been suffering from much more hypertension than women. That can also be directly linked back to sodium. At the national level, people suffering from hypertension, people suffering from high BP, high blood sugar level, all that is linked to sodium somewhere. And that is why the innocent salt that we used to put on our dish without even thinking that innocent salt is not that innocent anymore and that is why please remember even that can be dangerous now the government of india has done something about this the government of india under fssai has started a movement under eat right india there is a campaign that they call aaj se thoda kam please do remember this phrase aaj se thoda kam those who don't understand hindi this means a bit lesser from today. So this is a Hindi phrase, Aaj se thoda kam, translated to English, that will translate into slightly lesser from today. So the campaign is simple to reduce salt intake. Please do remember this phrase because this can be asked in the prelims examination very, very easily. The question can be that Aaj se thoda kam is related to what amongst the following. So that is related to mainly reducing sodium intake. As I said, India's average sodium intake right now is 11 grams per day, while the WHO recommended limit is only 5 grams, in fact, lesser than 5 grams. Now, I also wanted to share with you what exactly are the highlights of this WHO report about the sodium intake. First, the aim is to reduce global sodium intake by 30% by 2025. Secondly, the WHO report says, Reducing sodium intake is the easiest way to control non-communicable diseases. What are non-communicable diseases? So non-communicable diseases as the name said that cannot be transferred from one person to the other. So for example, high blood sugar level, high blood pressure, uh, diabetes, etc. Hypertension, all these are called non-communicable diseases. The WHO report also says that the global burden of all these diseases is increasing that is also because of pre-packaged food beverages etc that people consume if that is curtailed we will have a situation where the burden of non-communicable diseases comes down significantly now from india the concept of non-communicable diseases is extremely important the government of india focuses on this there have been multiple initiatives by the government to control non-communicable diseases. They account for about 60% of all the deaths in India. They include heart related diseases, strokes, hypertension, uh, diabetes, even cancer, etc. Tobacco is considered as a big threat and a big risk to all these diseases. In fact, one out of every 10 person aged 18 and above in India has high blood sugar level as compared to what it should be. And because of all these reasons, controlling the intake of sodium through salt or through any other means is extremely, extremely important. This was our second article for today. Let me see if you have some comments apart from suggesting me the brand of salt. Okay. Isn't talk about carbon emission, carbon trading privilege of developed nations and rich nations? See, you have to understand something. 
the world environment is one. Whether you like it or you don't like it, the entire world environment is one right now. What I mean to say is, if there is an adverse climatic situation in US, let's say floods or drought in US, you can't assume it will never impact me because I'm living far away from US. The entire world climate is one only right now. So if there are some problems in our environment in some part of the world, it will impact the other part of the world. So the fight against climate change has to be a united fight. You cannot say that just because I am not polluting, my country will be fine. Or just because I am not polluting, I will not have any pollution related problem. So it has been, it has to be a responsibility of everyone. Obviously, developed nations have to take more responsibility. But it is a responsibility of everyone. No one can say that I will not really come. I will not really uh, take anything away. Then I have a very tough question. How to measure 5 grams? Hmm, that's a tough question. How to measure 5 grams? Uh, maybe weighing machine <laughs> that's how you can measure five grams or if you want to or if you okay if your question is how to measure five grams of sodium in salt so basically the simple idea is one gram of sodium is in 2.5 grams of salt so if you are having let's say if you have 12.5 grams of salt that means that is five grams of sodium so I hope that solves that query. But I, you can get a weighing machine, weighing scale. There are kitchen weighing scales that you get. And I think that would not be a problem. 12.5 grams. Okay. Then let me see if there's something else. Uh, Apurva is saying, can salt company reduce the amount of NaCl in salt? Salt is made of Na and Cl. If you remove Na, it, only, it is only Cl. So chlorine is not salt. So I'm not sure how you can reduce sodium from salt because sodium chloride is salt. So again, if scientists come to that way, if scientists basically research and find out some other way possible. But I don't think if you take out sodium from salt, it will remain salt. Okay. Um, Okay, I'll take one, one more and then I'll go ahead. Um, eating salt is also harmful for human. What is the remedy? Remedy is not to eat salt. As simple as that. Nothing more. Okay, let's go ahead then. The next article that we have, uh, I think enough about salt now. Let's move on to more important topics now. The next article that we have here is about the independence of Scotland. Now, independence... Does it really mean that Scotland is still being ruled by someone else? Does it mean that Scotland is still under anyone else's control? Let's try and understand this. So, Scotland is an independent country and not really an independent country as well. So, how Scotland works is, in simple terms, they are a part of UK, United Kingdom. So, United Kingdom basically means England. Then there is Scotland, there is Wales, and there is Northern Ireland. All of these together are called United Kingdom. So, when you see the United Kingdom, how the power has been divided between all of these is, they have one combined parliament, they have the one joint parliament, that's the Westminster. Now, most of the laws on important matters about Scotland, please listen to this. Most of the matters like communication, defense, foreign relations. So most laws about Scotland are made in the UK Parliament. However, internally, Scotland Parliament can also make some of their laws. What they want is that we, what Scotland has been demanding is that we want to be an independent country altogether. We want entire control of our own resources, of our own decision making. Now, if we go back to the history, of how England, Scotland, all these came together. It all starts from the 9th century. So Kingdom of Scotland, as we used to call it, was formed in the 9th century. They fought a lot of wars, etc. to remain independent from England. However, in 1603, both the side, that is the Kingdom of Scotland and the Kingdom of England, they came together to sign an agreement. So in 1603, the agreement was signed that they will be ruled by the same monarch. So there will be one queen or one king who will rule over both the kingdoms. Then 1707, both these 
came together in a political union as well and the name Great Britain came into the picture. Now, since then, as I told you, Scotland's decision making power is divided in such a manner that they do have some representation in the UK Parliament. However, their representation is very low and they think that they deserve more representation number one. Secondly, they believe that they should be given more decision making powers. Now, what has happened here? What has happened is recently, if you have been reading the news, Scotland has a new first minister. Have you read the news? They have a new first minister. Now, first minister in Scotland is equal to prime minister only. They don't have the name prime minister, but the prime minister is actually called the first minister. So, Scotland has had a new first minister now just a few days back. As soon as this new first minister came into picture, this again, this demand again started. The demand is that we want to have a plebiscite in Scotland. A few years back also, Scotland had a plebiscite. In that plebiscite, 55% Scottish said that we don't want to become independent. Let me repeat, Scotland recently had their own plebiscite where 55% people, Scottish people said we don't want to be independent. Now, they want to have a new referendum once again. The 2014 one was where 55% Scottish voted to stay with UK. But now they want to have a new referendum, a new plebiscite altogether to make sure that they decide on their destiny once again. Now, what exactly is this issue all about? I'll try and basically take you there as well. But firstly, Remember, this entire demand from Scotland is usually made by one political party, that is SNP. They are in power. Scottish National Party. They are the ones who usually have been making this demand of having an independent Scotland. They are the ones who are in power even right now. Now, this entire movement, and please listen to this, this entire movement of Scotland becoming independent actually started from 1970s. How? In 1970s, there was a discovery of oil in the North Sea. In North Sea, and I'll show you the map as well. In North Sea, there was discovery of oil. Now, when this oil was found, this is where the struggle started. UK, United Kingdom, wanted to say that this is now our property. We will decide how oil will be extracted. We will decide how oil will be sold. Money that we earn will be used for everyone. Scotland, on the other hand, said no. In that era of 1970s, there was a new slogan that started in Scotland, a slogan that is famous even today. The slogan was, it's Scotland's oil. That is a very famous slogan even today in Scotland. It's Scotland's oil. The simple idea is the oil that has been found in the North Sea. That is our oil. We should be the one deciding how to sell it. Whatever money that is being earned should be used only for Scotland and not for entire UK. That was the entire idea. However, this demand obviously has not been accepted. Whatever oil that has been taken out is not just utilized or it's not the money is not just spent on Scotland. It's spent on everyone. Scotland says that we don't agree with a lot of British policies. Scotland says that we want to be separate. For example, Scotland wants to become a part of EU once again. They want to have different policies such as free education, free geriatric care. Geriatric care means elderly care basically. So geriatric care is elderly care. They want to have taxation on higher earners. They want to have green transition. They want to also be very open to the LGBTQ community. So Scotland is saying that we have a lot of other policy ideas and we don't agree with what UK is doing. So we want to be independent, we want to have a plebiscite. But again, allowing the plebiscite also has to be done by the UK Parliament only. If the UK Parliament does not pass or does not allow them to have the plebiscite, they can't have the plebiscite. In 2014 also, it was the Parliament that allowed them to have the plebiscite, only then they could have it. But now they are not being allowed to have this plebiscite. UK is saying that no, we will not do that. Why? Because they are saying number one, they just had a plebiscite not even 10 years ago. 
Secondly, they are saying that we don't believe that SNP, that is the Scottish National Party, has any idea about how to make policy. They are just making demands, etc. So we don't want that to happen. They also say if Scotland again joins EU, then we will not have open border with Scotland because we don't believe that. So these kind of issues still remain in contention. They have not been solved. Tell me something. Have you heard, and please don't Google this. Have you heard of a place called Catalonia? Have you heard of this place? Catalonia. Any idea? And please don't Google it. Just tell me which country is it in? Or where is this? What is this related to? Catalonia. Okay. Thank you for being honest and not Googling it. Okay. Those who Googled it now are telling me the answer. <laughs> okay. Just kidding. Don't worry. Spain. This is a region in Spain. Now, why I am telling you this? Please understand this. Understand this. So, basically what happens is what Scotland is demanding is nothing new. Usually, please understand this. Usually, whenever there is a country in which one specific part of the country is rich or more developed than the others. Please listen to what I'm trying to say. Whenever there is a country in which one part of the country is more developed, it's richer. They always have this problem because they believe that revenue or taxes from our region should be spent on our region only. Why is it that we are giving taxes and everyone else in the country is eating from those taxes? So there is usually a demand from the most developed part of the country always that we want to become independent. Catalonia is again, uh, this there is a region in Spain. They want to become separate. They, this has been an ongoing demand. They want a separate country altogether because they think the entire Spanish country is running from their revenue only. And this question was asked a couple of years back in the UPSC prelims exam. There was a match the column question asked in which Catalonia was written. You had to match with which in which country is it associated. So the demand that Scotland has, it's nothing new. It's usually a demand that you see across the world that whenever there is a developed part of a country, they would want to remain independent. Here I wanted to show you. So this is where Scotland is. This is England. This is Wales. This is Northern Ireland. This together is called United Kingdom, UK, all of these together. And this is the North Sea. So North Sea is the one where we have found, we means not I, but they have found oil resources here. And this is the center of contention now. Because of all these oil resources, Scotland wants that the revenue should be spent only on their development and not the entire country. On the other hand, the other part of the country at his United Kingdom say that no, we will utilize it for everyone. Over here, by the way, I would suggest you please look at the Atlas and do make a note of the nations that share a border with the North Sea for the prelims examination. Please do make a note of that because of all this demand. So please Make a note of that for the prelims examination. This is important. North Sea, the boundaries related to the North Sea, etc., are important. Also, uh, not this. One. Yeah, the North Sea oil that I was talking about. North Sea oil is in demand around the entire world. It has a mixture of hydrocarbons. The North Sea, in fact, also is or has deposits of natural gas, petroleum, etc. From 1960s to 2014, so far, 42 billion barrels of oil has already been extracted. As per the experts, the oil reserves in the North Sea would be enough for the next 35 years as well. Especially at a time that the entire European continent is under pressure from Russia. They don't want to buy oil gas from Russia. They don't want Russia to get a boost from their revenue, especially at that time oil extraction from North Sea becomes extremely, extremely relevant. And it is at the same time that Scotland is also raising such kind of demands. Perfect. One other topic from the mains point of view that he wanted to discuss is about defamation. Now defamation again, as we have seen, has been in the news because of the expansion of Mr. Rahul Gandhi from the Lok Sabha. The reason why he was disqualified from the Lok Sabha, we have discussed this multiple times, is because of the Surat Court's decision to give him a sentence of two years. The reason behind all of that was a defamation. Now, what exactly is defamation? 
in simple terms if you put allegations against someone you try to uh, disregard them you try to hurt their public image in simple terms that is called defamation so if you go in the public and you say that do you know this person does this i have proof that this person has taken so much money from here this person does this without any proof all that would come under the definition of defamation now defamation is the law that the british introduced there is a very interesting british saying that you should all remember the greater the truth the greater the libel libel means when you put a case against someone that i will hold you responsible for my defamation so basically the greater the truth means the better the truth is the bigger will be the defamation lawsuit and how dare you say this against me all that was the truth so basically british were the ones who introduced this defamation law in india and as expected even after the british went away we still have the defamation law because the independent india's government independent india's political parties also wanted this kind of a law because see every government wants to have as much control over power as possible the ipc section 499 and section 500 talk about defamation section 499 criminalizes defamation section 500 of the ipc talks about <clears throat> talks about the maximum punishment for defamation that is up to 2 years now the problem with defamation here is that many people think that defamation should not really be allowed or defamation should not really be considered as a very serious offense because the problem with defamation is it is very difficult to prove on the other hand if you actually take the defamation law very seriously it will also curtail the freedom of expression of many other people the supreme court in fact has been supportive of the defamation law in the past there have been certain interesting supreme court cases where supreme court has talked about defamation and the need to have punishment for defamation supreme court has said that right to reputation is also a part of article 21 and you cannot destroy anyone's reputation just because you want and you have freedom of expression the supreme court has said article 20 article 19 does not allow you to go against anyone's reputation in fact the supreme court has said that this section 499 does not even allow for honest mistake as a defense please try and understand this let's assume that i make a public statement against a well known individual and i make allegations that this person is corrupt he has taken this much money that much money i cannot go to the court and say sir sorry this was an honest mistake i read it somewhere but maybe i read some different name so i am sorry that will also not give me the freedom from the court even then i will be punished so honest mistake is also punishable that is what article 499 or section 499 of the ipc is if you have been charged with defamation you cannot go to the court and say sir it was an honest mistake i just read something very differently i did not remember it etc even in that case you can be punished you would have read there are now pils filed in the court after rahul gandhi's case there are pils filed in the court according to which many people are suggesting that defamation at least should not become a criteria for disqualification for the law makers at least the legislators mps mlas etc should not be disqualified on the basis of defamation but that is where we are right now defamation again is extremely important for the examination point of view especially because of what has happened in the past couple of weeks section 499 and section 500 of the ipc as we discussed talk about defamation while section 499 talks about what is defamation how is it defined section 500 talks about the punishment for defamation do remember the supreme court has taken it very seriously in the past according to them right to reputation is extremely important and it is a part of article 21 supreme court has given multiple verdicts in defamation issue for example mahindra ram versus harnandan prasad 1958 this was again a defamation related case 2006 Subramanyam Swami versus Ram Jethmalani 2015 Shreya Singhal 
all these cases are where the Supreme Court has time and time again upheld the law for defamation. They have said that defamation cannot be taken out. There have been multiple PILs filed in the court especially to take out defamation as a law calling it unconstitutional but the Supreme Court has so far not taken out the law according to them this is a part of the law and this is not unconstitutional please do remember some examples of such cases as well perfect before we go on to the prelims part let me take up a few comments Shruti is saying defamation is applicable to government or common public also should be applicable to anyone if someone makes statements against you, damages your reputation, you can also go to the court and file a petition case against them. So it is for everyone, not just for public officials. Then, uh, Shrikant Singh, any insight on how EU's policy regarding carbon trading is dealt with in their industry and population? See, EU, as we discussed, they do have a law for carbon trading. They have imposed import tax as well on those products that are made using carbon emissions see in eu still there is kind of a protest on the people especially ever since the ukraine russia war has started since the cost of living has gone up but by and far in eu when these kind of policies are made especially with respect to environment etc they are not protested a lot so it's not a lot of protest that's going on but yes the cost of living is increasing after ukraine russia war so the politicians themselves are now thinking about their vote bank. Then let me take up a question. How is it different from sedition? Sedition is against a nation. Defamation is against an individual. Then uh, should we study sections of defamation? Just two sections of defamation. Just two sections of uh, IPC 499 and 500. You don't have to study IPC apart from that. <laughs> Thank you for telling me how do I look and how do I not look. Let's focus on if you have any questions from the topic. Um, then, Rishabh, it is both criminal and uh, civil as well, depending upon what, what is the statement that is made. Perfect. Manish is saying, how is Great Britain different from England? So basically, there are England is one separate country. Great Britain is a group of those nations coming together. Perfect. Let's move ahead then. Uh, let's focus on a few topics from the prelims point of view specifically. There are three topics that we have taken up which are important and relevant for the prelims. The first one that we have is Pradhan Mantri Swanidhi scheme. Under this scheme, the government of India gives collateral free loans to the street vendors. It started after the COVID-19 lockdown when a lot of workers had to leave their job from the villages, from the cities, sorry, had to go back to the villages. Many of them were now self-dependent. They had to do something on their own. So for them to start some business, street vending business, some roadside business, small amount of loan was required they don't get a loan from the bank because either they don't have the documents and banks are also not interested in giving these small kind of loans so under this pm swanidhi scheme the government of india gives 10000 rupees of collateral free loans and subsequent loans of 20000 50000 also with 7% interest subsidy that is this small idea it's a micro credit scheme now the reason why it is in the news is the government of india has made a statement in the parliament under which not even 10% of these loans have gone to the minority community. So most of them have gone to a non-minority section. Now rather than remembering how much percentage of it went to minority, non-minority, for us it is more important to understand and remember the provisions of the scheme. Now as I told you, this scheme was introduced at the time when India was going through the lockdowns. So it was a part of the economic stimulus. The government of India wanted to give working capital to those who have lost out on their jobs and who wanted to start their own small business. Under this scheme, the government of India gives working capital loan, incentivizes if the repayment is made on time, then they can take a higher loan. So first loan is 10,000. If they make payment on time, then they can take a 20,000 loan also. And if they make that payment also on time, then up to 50,000 loan can also be given. Also, the government of India gives a push to digital transactions in all these cases which is 
the ministry running this scheme it is the ministry of housing and urban affairs please do remember that and it's a central sector scheme i hope all of you know the difference there is central sector scheme and then there is central sponsored scheme there are two different types of scheme central sector means 100% by union government only central sector means government of india and the states will also contribute a part of it so this is a central sector scheme mainly now what is the eligibility criteria who can actually take the benefits from this scheme this scheme is only for those uts and states which are or which have notified the rules under the street vendors act of 2014 apart from this beneficiaries from meghalaya have also been given a special status here they can also participate street vendors all across the urban areas can now participate in this scheme earlier this scheme was available to street vendors only from before march 24 2020 now any street vendor can apply for this scheme please do remember the provisions of such schemes who runs it whatever the objective is just a suggestion whenever you come across any government scheme there are just four things that you have to remember you can make a table also so make a table first column the name of the government scheme second column the ministry that is running the scheme third column the funding pattern is it centrally funded or is it central plus state fourth column should be what is the target of the scheme what do they want to achieve for example scheme about let's say reducing malnutrition or scheme about increasing uh, tap water connection etc and in the end what is the target audience target audience means is it for rural areas is it for urban area is it for minority community only is it for older people only is it for people from different section of society these four are the only four details that you need about any government scheme again number 1 if you have a government scheme the ministry second funding pattern third the aim or the objective and fourth what exactly is it that they are trying to achieve or who exactly are they targeting is it for tribals is it for scs is it for minority is it for women whatever these four things are the only thing that you would need for any scheme for the prelims examination so do make a table for whatever kind of schemes that you come across then another interesting news philippines has allocated four more military bases to the us troops now the history of us and philippines is very interesting usa always says that we were never a colonial power we never ruled over any country but the reality is philippines was one country over which the us did rule so philippines is widely regarded as the only kind of a semi colony that the us had with philippines us still maintains very close relationship the importance of philippines is that they have a south china sea dispute with china china as you know wants to control the entire south china sea philippines also has claims to certain south parts of south china sea so philippines has been a partner with india or oh, sorry with the us for a long long time in philippines us already has certain military bases now they have given four more military bases this is an agreement that the two countries have us and philippines the agreement is called enhanced defense cooperation agreement under which philippines military will be held by the american military and american military bases will be set up in philippines now as i said philippines importance is not that it's a very powerful country or powerful military the importance of philippines is in its strategic location the military bases that philippines has given to us are very close to taiwan as well this is what china does not like china does not appreciate the fact that us now has a military base very close to taiwan because they think if they try and capture taiwan america would interfere very quickly us as i said already had two major military bases in philippines they were closed in 1990s but they were again opened up later on these are the four new military bases that have been given if you just look at these these are the four 1 2 3 and 4 and look at how close is it to taiwan the kagayan military base this is extremely close to taiwan this is what china does not like china says that we did not want you to even visit taiwan and now you have a military base very close to this 
This is also because all these nations have a stake in this South China Sea area, which China thinks that it is its own. Now, while we are on this topic of military base in other countries, I also wanted to give you some examples of India's military bases. It's not that only other countries have military bases outside their country. India also has certain military bases in other parts of the world. Although most of them are in our neighborhood only and not very far away. But just to give you an example, Tajikistan has an Indian air base. We have one in Bhutan. Bhutan has Indian military training team that is permanently stationed in Bhutan. We have one in Madagascar, Oman also. Uh, recently, with Mauritius and with Seychelles, India got one island each from them. Do remember these names? A few years back from Mauritius, India took, I won't say control of, but India took almost kind of ownership of the Agalega Islands. And similarly, with Seychelles also, we have taken certain islands, that is the Assumption Island, from where India has put up its surveillance systems. So it's not just US or China, etc. India also has certain military bases outside India because we think that they can be extremely important just in case we are facing certain uh, adversary. We also would have certain ways in which we can counter them. The last news for today is a decision from OPEC Plus. OPEC Plus, as you know, is a group of major oil producing and exporting nations around the world. They have decided to come together and reduce the oil production. Now, why would you reduce the oil production? The idea is simple. Whenever the global oil prices reduce, these OPEC countries want to artificially increase the prices. How to artificially increase the prices? Cut down on the oil supply, as simple as that. So these countries have come together. They have decided to cut down the oil supply so that the global oil prices increase. The global oil prices have hit about $70 per barrel. They want it to go up because this is their major source of revenue. Now, this is the amount of cut that every country has announced from OPEC+. Plus. Saudi Arabia, which is the largest producer of oil in OPEC, they are the ones who have announced the biggest cut. Then UAE, Kuwait, Iraq, Algeria, all these have announced a cut in the oil production. Again, the idea is simple. If you reduce the oil supply in the international market, the price will automatically increase. Now, which one country would be unhappy with this? Just imagine. The one country extremely unhappy is USA. Why? See, oil is right now the biggest source of revenue from Russia. So because Russia will gain when the oil prices increase, obviously Russia will be happy because they will earn more money. So USA is very unhappy. USA thought, USA said that this is not good. You should not have done this. You are supporting the war efforts of Russia by increasing the oil prices. But again, OPEC plus countries, every country would act in its own national interest. No country would really bother what is happening in a third or fourth country. So for OPEC plus countries, they are more concerned about their own economy. If the oil prices increase, they will be the one who will benefit from this as well. Now, whenever these kind of decisions are taken, that oil prices will be, oil production will come down. This is not immediate. It will take some time. So this decision of cutting down the oil production will be applicable from the beginning of May, not before that. So since, the, since when the month of May begins, that is when the oil production will come down. Now OPEC, as the name suggests, is the organization of petroleum exporting countries. It was a group founded in 1960 and is a group of those nations which are the major exporters of oil around the world. Saudi Arabia being the most prominent member of this. What they do is they form a cartel so that they can artificially increase or decrease the oil prices in the market. If they increase production, automatically the oil prices will decrease. If they reduce production, automatically the oil prices will come down. Then there's APEC Plus as well. Sorry, OPEC Plus. OPEC plus is those countries which are apart from OPEC, other oil producers around the world. So OPEC plus, for example, has nations as Azerbaijan, Russia, Bahrain. So, sorry, these are OPEC. OPEC plus has countries such as South Sudan, Sudan, Malaysia, etc. Russia, all these are part of OPEC plus as well. OPEC plus decision to decrease the oil production would not have any 
immediate impact on India or any other country. Please understand this. If any country in immediately says that we will be cutting down the production, that doesn't really mean that something will happen right now. Because all these things take some time to reflect in the international market. Also, when you talk about oil wells around the entire world, it's not as easy to cut down on the production. Cutting down on production also requires a lot of time, lot of effort. So when this production cut actually comes into force, when it is implemented, it will take some time. Till that time, there is no global disruption in the oil market. But yes, we might see increase in prices. When the decision was announced, in international global prices did increase by about 7%. But the main increase will be seen in about one month or so, not right now. This brings me to the end of today's discussion of the Hindu newspaper. As always, there are a couple of practice questions for you from what we have studied. After the session ends, you have to all go over to our Telegram channel where you will be having a quiz on the topics that we have discussed to so revise this. For those who don't know how to download the PDF, see the description of the video. You will find a link to download the PDF and you can use that for revising as well. Thank you so much for joining in. I'll see you tomorrow, 10 a.m. Make sure that you already subscribe to our YouTube channel and join in at 10 a.m. every single day. Have a good day ahead. Bye-bye.